with k-means clustering, we imagine partitioning up our n-dimensional feature space into k different regions. The number of regions or number of clusters is something that's predefined. This is a hyperparameter that we get to choose coming into the learning process. Each of our clusters we parameterize in, in terms of its center location within this n-dimensional feature space. The learning process involves an iterative process. We first guess at where our cluster centers are and how we choose that depends on exactly what the implementation looks like for our algorithm. And then we go about a repetitive process. So first we uh, measure the distance between each of the samples that we have in our data set and the cluster centers. We then assign membership to each of the clusters based on that distance or that similarity. And then given the, that membership, we then re-estimate where the cluster centers ought to be. And this is repeated multiple times, and often it's in the hundreds, uh, until things uh, settle out and we have a, a stable assignment of samples to clusters. The initialization process varies depending upon the implementation of the algorithm. We can take a distribution type of an approach or a sample-based approach. With the distribution approach, one possibility is that we just pick our centers using some uniform sampling within the feature space. Another possibility is that we construct a, a Gaussian distribution over all of our samples in our training set, and then we sample from this Gaussian distribution in order to pull out our centers. The sampling-based approach, and this is the approach that I tend to take when I implement this algorithm, is that we just go into our training set and we uniformly sample K samples and then assign those as our cluster centers. This way, we have a reasonable notion that these centers are actually coming from a reasonable representation of the distribution of the samples within our feature space. There are really two fundamental forms of k-means clustering. One is a hard boundary classification. And what we mean by this is that every sample in the training set is assigned one particular label. And this assignment can happen even if the sample uh, appears at a very far distance away from the cluster center. In k-means clustering, our training set is composed of a set of samples, and we'll designate those, as we've been doing, as xi's. And then our model is composed of a set of k clusters. And each cluster has a center, and we'll refer to that as MK. So K here refers to the index of a particular cluster. And this is also in the n-dimensional space. Likewise for the XIs, these are n-dimensional. And with the hard boundary, yi is our class label, and it is assigned to the cluster whose center is closest to our feature vector. So the formal way to write this is argmin over all of our classes, and we're going to measure the distance between our cluster center and our sample i. Right. It's, also, it's also convenient to define another variable, and in this case, it's going to be a binary variable. I'm going to refer to it as BIK, and it is going to take on either a value of 0 or 1. It's 1 if the class label is equal to K, and it's 0 otherwise. That's going to allow us to define some other things very conveniently. All right, so let's look at what this means in terms of a feature space. So here, here is a feature space. We'll label that as x0 and x1. And if I have two uh, clusters, so let's call uh, m, this point here is m0, and this point here is m1. If I have some sort of a sample point, let's call that xi out here, then 
this particular sample is is closer to M1 than it is M0. So the corresponding yi is going to be equal to one. So what does the full set of samples look like within this x0, x1 space that are all assigned to class one and which ones are assigned to class zero? And that turns out to be a dividing line that sits right between uh, M0 and M1. So first let me draw in this dividing line here. Oops, not quite hit the right spot there. There we go. So this is the line that runs between M0 and M1. The dividing line itself is actually uh, going to be orthogonal to uh, this line and uh, right at the midpoint between M0 and M1. So that it intersects about there and runs orthogonally through that point. Okay, so that, that's a right angle right there. So all of the samples to the right and down, all of these, this is class one, and everything to the left, this is class zero. So let's write that in. Oops, this is one over here, and this is zero over here. All right, so, so this is the two class case, it's relatively trivial. What happens when we what happens when we look at the three class case? So let's draw a new version of our feature space here. And let's put in our M0. And we'll do uh, M1 here and let's do M2 over here. So in this region here, we're either going to be in M1 or M2, class one or class two, but as we get closer to M0, at some point we're going to flip over to uh, M0. And the, the key point here is the point that is equidistant between all three of these clusters. So that sits, that sits right about there, a little bit more to the left there. So this distance here is equal to this distance here and, and this distance here. Okay, and then the dividing lines, put that point back. The dividing lines between our three clusters emanate from this particular point. So off to the right-hand side, uh, I've conveniently drawn one and two such that they're on either side of this, of this horizontal line, so the dividing line is right there. The dividing line, uh, for here runs between this point here and the, uh, the midpoint between M0 and M2. So it runs off this direction. And then the dividing line between M0 and, and M1 uh, runs orthogonal to that line there. Okay, let me clean that up. Okay, so now uh, anything that falls within this region here, it's closer to M1 than either of the two clust other clusters. And so it's assigned, a, a point there is assigned a class label of one. Anything over here is closest to M0 and it's assigned a class label of zero. This also means that a point say way out over here, it's assigned a class label of one even though it's far away from the center for cluster one. It's also the case that a point right here is assigned a label of one, and if I move it just up just a little bit, so I don't go very far in, in terms of distance, I cross that line and, and now suddenly the class label flips over to two. The two class scenario, the three class scenario, these are both pretty uh, trivial. We can, once we get into a larger number of classes, one can have uh, easily scenarios where we don't have all of these regions meeting at a single point, but we still end up in a situation where our feature space is completely partitioned 
into uh, these different uh, regions. And any given point is always uh, in one of those regions, exactly, except along these dividing lines. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what the learning algorithm looks like. I want to be able to reference the math that we did up here. So we're going back up to the top. So we've already talked about the process of assigning points to particular classes, but the remaining step in the learning algorithm is that we want to update these MKs. And it turns out uh, that it's rather a, a trivial uh, process. So what we do is we look at all of the samples that have been assigned to cluster K and we compute the average uh, of their points and that becomes our new center point for cluster K. So there are a variety of different ways to write this. I'm gonna write it in uh, a little bit more complicated way, but it's going to generalize nicely as we get into the more complicated versions of the algorithm. So I'm going to say MK gets assigned to, we're going to do a weighted sum of our XIs and divide that by the sum of our BI case. And this, the sum is over all of our samples. This is a fancy way of saying, uh, since, since BI, BIK is either zero or one, it's, this is a fancy way of saying, take all of the samples for which BIK is one and then compute the mean of those XIs. So the, the denominator here just gives us the number of samples that are in cluster K, and, and then the numerator is just the, the sum of all of the XIs uh, that belong to cluster K. So the learning process then, as we talked about, is an iterative one. We first assign points to clusters, we, we've already made a guess as to what the cluster centers ought to be. We assign points to clusters. Then we re-estimate what the cluster centers are. And then we come back over to the left and we reassign points to clusters. And, and then we go back to uh, re-estimating what the cluster centers are. And we continue to bounce back and forth between these two different steps uh, until things have uh, settled out. So let's look at what that might look like with a real scenario. So let me draw out a, a feature space here. So this is x0 by x1. And let's put in some training samples. So here's, here's one set here. Here's another set. So another set over here. And then we'll do a set right in this area here. And clearly I have in mind as I'm drawing this that there should be three clusters. And so there's, there's one there, there's one here, and there's one uh, sitting up here. And, that, and that's really fundamentally the answer that we want our algorithm to discover. So the first step is to assign those initial cluster centers. And we're going to just take the approach here of sampling from our training set and, and to use those as our cluster centers. So I'm going to choose in this case, I'm going to choose this point right here and this point right here, and we'll pick this point here. So given these three cluster centers, let's figure out how they partition up the space. So our first step will be to figure out where, uh, what, which point is equidistant from all of these uh, center points. And I believe, so the, the center, the point that is equidistant from all of these cluster centers is sitting right here. And the dividing line between, if we call this one zero and this one one and this one two, the dividing line between zero and two runs along here, and the dividing line between 0 and 1 runs along, along here, 
And finally, the dividing line between one and two really sits out in this direction here. All right, so, so what this means is that all of the samples here are assigned to cluster one. The, the few samples that are here are assigned to cluster zero, and this set of samples here is assigned to cluster two. But let's look at, say, cluster one here. The, the next step in the process is to re-estimate what that cluster center ought to be. So what we do is we take all of those uh, samples and we ask what the mean location is. And, and eyeballing this, that mean location probably sits about right here. So we're gonna move that purple circle over to this location. And then likewise, looking at uh, cluster two, that center of mass is probably sitting about right here. There are, there are more in this upper region than there are down below, so, so the cluster center is still gonna be a little bit more toward that, that region. So the purple is gonna move down to there. And, and then finally, this small set of points right here, the center of mass is probably right about in there. And then from here, what we do is uh, go back to the process of assigning points to clusters. So let's figure out what the new dividing lines are for our green cluster centers. And before I do that, I'm gonna clean up this diagram a, a little bit. Actually, let's leave the, the orange in there, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete the, the purple. Okay, so what's the center point for this set of mean uh, cluster centers? That center point sits probably about right there. So what that means is that this now becomes the dividing line between zero and two. And the dividing line between one and two sits somewhere around, uh, around here. And I'm eyeballing this so, so that it's not a perfect fit, but uh, we're close. And then the, finally, the dividing line for uh, between zero and one sits here. All right, so the choices that we're making here are very different between our first iteration and this new one. So, so the difference between orange and red are, are, is, is quite stark. And in particular, let me go ahead and get rid of the orange now. It's, it's now this set of points here that's being assigned to cluster zero. It's this set of points here that are being assigned to cluster one, and then this whole collection of points being assigned to cluster two. Cluster zero, we're probably already pretty close to the center of mass. The center probably moves a little bit down to here. For cluster one, we don't actually have a whole lot of points to, to work with now. That center of mass probably sits about here, so it, it moves a fair amount. For, for cluster two, really the set of points hasn't changed all that much. So uh, we're, we'll just assume that it's in the same location. All right, for these new cluster centers, now the question is how do they partition up the space? So let's find the point that is equidistant between all of the purple circles. And that point probably hasn't changed all that much from our red center. But now the dividing line between one and two really runs in this direction here. The dividing line between zero and two sits pretty pretty similar uh, location. And then zero and one, the dividing line now sort of heads off in this direction. So we've done a, a good job now of capturing zero. One, we're still not quite resolved. Two, we're not quite resolved, but we're getting closer. But the key, one of the keys here is that this set of points here has now changed affiliation. They used to be part of cluster two, they're now part of uh, cluster one. All right, let me go ahead and erase the orange, or sorry, the red, so it is out of the way, and we'll get rid of the green cluster centers as much as possible anyway. All right, and our class labels now have to shift a little bit. This is cluster one over here. Okay, so cluster zero, the, the center of mass really hasn't changed, so that's not going to move. 
For cluster one, we now have a new set of points over here, as we already talked about. So its center is going to move a bit. Cluster two has lost this set of points here. So it's actually going to start to migrate up in this direction here. And now let's look at how these new cluster centers divide up space. The, the center point really hasn't changed all that, all that much. It's, uh, it's probably sitting, I don't know, it's probably sitting about right there. The dividing line between zero and two hasn't changed too much. It kind of sits off in this direction now. The dividing line between zero and one hasn't really changed all that much. But look at what's happened with the dividing line between two and one. So now it runs down the middle between the, the two cluster centers. And we've now sort of migrated to a point where we actually kind of capture our intuition as to what the different clusters are. So let me clean up the, the purple here so we can look at this a little bit more carefully. Now all of these points have been assigned to cluster one. All of these have been assigned to two, and these are still part of cluster zero. So, so this matches our intuition really well. If we were to take another step, uh, cluster one and cluster two, their centers are going to migrate just a little bit. Uh, closer to, to their means, but the change is not going to be all that substantial. And the flavors, the cluster assignments for the various points is, is not going to change anymore. All right, so that's a sketch of the hard boundary uh, algorithm and how it actually works in the case of uh, three clusters in a plane. It works in the same way as we add more clusters. It's just their boundaries start to get more complicated. They're still linear uh, in, in this space, um, but they, do, they don't necessarily meet at the center point anymore. Next up, let's uh, get away from the hard boundary situation and look at the soft boundary approach.